in time. Uh, so we are going to talk about the sustainability in the container, uh, container native way. My name is Huang Ming Chen. I'm uh, working as a Red Hat's emerging technology team. Um, my, my name is Chen Wang. I'm from IBM Research. I'm a research staff member. So the agenda for today is that we're going to talk about the uh, power management, power measurement in theory, and how we're going to do it in practice. And we'll introduce our projects for power uh, measurement uh, called Project Kepler. And we'll talk about what's going to use these uh, projects for uh, what's going up, uh, coming up in energy conservation. And we are going to be excited to share with you what uh, has been happening in the community. And Chen will give you the demo for these um, uh, projects. So uh, as a refresher, um, Energy management is not uh, something new. It has been going on for many, many years. Uh, we are talking about, we have both the theory as well as the methodology. Uh, um, in reality, we care more about the, uh, the question, how we are going to measure the energy consumption indirectly or directly, uh, especially in our uh, operating system that is shared by a lot of uh, running containers and processes. And now, now we come to the second question is, is uh, how once we get the energy uh, measurement in place, how can we attribute this uh, energy consumption to different processes or containers fairly and accurately? So this is about the two questions. So if you go to the uh, wiki page, you find out there's a very exhaustive um, explanations about energy measurements in a um, you know, digital world. Uh, the, the gist of the idea of the measurements is that uh, there's three components in the CPU uh, energy consumption, the dynamic, uh, the short circuits, and the leakage. And the detail of which, and you can go in deeper into the wiki page, but what is the matters here is that the, the dynamic energy which is consumed by running the CPU instructions is the major component of the CPU uh, power consumption. And there's also something called leakage uh, um, currents, which is the, the current the, the currents needed to make the uh, circuits running, uh, even there's nothing going on. Um, the dynamic power is determined by three factors. Uh, the capacitance, the number of circuits that are running, the voltage um, in real time in the, uh, data centers specifically uh, is not something you can tune, so we just leave it as static, and the frequencies at which the uh, circuit is operating. So just keep in mind that we have two things, the capacitance and the frequencies, those are the two things we want to um, get a hold of when we come to the power management, uh, power measurement. So now we come to the, uh, the methodology. Um, if you are um, electricians, you can attach the power meters to the circuits and measure the powers of each circuit and the durations and the frequencies. But in the software world, that is not something we can do. So we have to think about something creative. The, uh, the way we are doing the, uh, doing the measurements in software world is that uh, we use certain things uh, from the CPU, from the software counters, and from the system uh, measurements. For frequency, we use the average frequencies that is running inside of the uh, software system. Uh, in the uh, we can read from the CPU counter. Uh, specifically, if you are running the um, x86 CPUs, there's like a perf counter. You can read over the time what's the frequencies, average frequencies uh, during the time intervals. That is used for our estimation. For capacitance, because we do not have a great ways, or there's an impossible ways to monitor the number of circuits uh, being running. So we have some creative ways to use in the CPU instructions. Because the CPU instructions um, have very deterministic ways to use in the circuits um, on board. So by measuring the number of uh, CPU instructions, you have good correlations with the uh, number of with the capacitance uh, with the CPU instructions. Uh, finally, we also want to have the execution time um, that's for the circuits to stay on. Um, since we do not know exactly how many times the circuit is being stay on, we use some of the, something indirect using CPU cycles. Uh, as long as the CPU is still running, the number of cycles we count will be a good measurement of the execution time of the circuit. Now with the measurements in mind, uh, the second question we are going to answer is uh, how are you going to attribute your measurements to the consumptions of each of the processes or just um, containers. Um, you know, if you are familiar with this um, space, that you have seen a lot of uh, software projects or software packages that are trying to answer this question. They come from different perspectives. The way is that uh, we 
every one of us agree on that we have to use certain utilization to, as a proxy and you attribute your energy consumption based on the utilization. But there was a, that's the end of the agreements. The disagreements is how we are going to measure the utilization. Are you measuring the, the utilization based on time? Are you measuring um, based on the um, actual accounting at the kernel level? Or as your measurements as the whole stack? So our ways of um, attribution methodology is that uh, we measure the execution time at the kernel level. So whenever the process is gets uh, running, we start our accounting. Once the process is scheduled out, we take snapshots and using that accumulated stats as um, you know, the benchmark for our estimates. So in this way, we can fairly accurately attribute the energy to the processes uh, without a loss of, um, you know, um, loss of transparency. So just putting things together. So the way we are trying to measure the physical um, CPU, uh, the CPU or G, uh, memory or any of the uh, digital device is using the, um, the methodologies um, as approximations to the real world energy measurements. And we use models that we can derive from machine learnings to improve our accuracy. When we come to the attribution, we are trying to use the utilizations that's actually consumed by the process or containers to estimate the cons energies consumed by these entities without losing accuracy. And this not only, you know, this probably sounds simple, but that's the fundamental ways, the fundamental differences. Uh, our project is different from the others. So now we have to introduce the projects we have been working on collaboratively. It's called a Kepler. Uh, it's a Kubernetes-based efficient power level exporter. If you are a uh, you know, science lobby hobbyist, you know that is uh, coincidentally uh, relates to the astronomer uh, Johannes Kepler, uh, in the eight, who has these uh, laws of uh, planetary movements and also correlates with the NASA's uh, Kepler's the telescope. That basically means the same thing. You have to have certain ways to measure uh, precisely and proportionally in the real world. So Kepler is focused on three things. I want to do three things uh, in the best way. So it's about reporting. We are trying to collect information from the system about the GPU, CPU, RAM, as well as the other uh, hardware resources we are trying to measure, that we are consuming energy that we are trying to measure. And we are trying to do it both on bare metal as well as uh, virtual machines. So if you are running the machines on, uh, for example, the hybrid cloud, you could have some of the energy uh, stats coming up as well. So we are trying, to, because we are living in the Kubernetes world, so we are using the CNCF um, ecosystem, Prometheus is the way to go. So we export the stats from Prometheus. Um, the way we collect this information about the, you know, um, the performance counters, uh, the CPU cycles, and the CPU time is through eBPF. Uh, this gives us the ability to attach to the kernel trace points and I collect the snapshots of the performance counters without losing a lot of um, uh, overhead. And uh, lastly, uh, we are trying to use the science-based uh, regression models uh, to, uh, to improve our accuracy of energy estimates. Uh, the, um, the first paper, actually, because of right now we are in Texas, the per first paper I read is about the using performance counters to estimate um, power, esti uh, estimates power consumptions uh, on a different level of the systems was of the paper um, done professors from U University of Texas in about 10 years ago. So it's an interesting coincidence we come to here to have our presentation. The architecture, it looks like the bubble up way. So if you are like looking at the very bottom, we are connecting data at the kernel level using eBPF. So the eBPF attached to the um, sw uh, process switch function and it collects certain information and as the take a snapshots of the performance counters and take the deltas and push up that information to the data aggregation. On the left side of the data aggregation, you have the energy accounting stats. On the X86 platforms, you have REPL. On other CPU platforms, you could have some other uh, CPU uh, energy counters. And we want to collaborate with some um, vendors to see how we are going to get information from there. On the right side of the equation, you will see uh, different stats we collect as the aggregation layer. 
uh, starts from the kernel EBPF and starts from the C-group file system and starts from GPU libraries. Uh, specifically, in this case, uh, we're using the NVIDIA's uh, uh, GPU library to get the, uh, the GPU power and the process data. And we also collect data from the hardware monitors, uh, information like uh, frequencies, and we are going to have the information like uh, temperatures as well in the future. We put all everything into a regression model that we are, be, we are going, to, going to explain later. That is derived by the model server. And we're using simple stat, uh, regression models like a linear regression to start. And in fact, many of the research suggests that linear regression is very powerful. It uh, gives us a lot of accuracy in energy estimates. As the data presentation layer, we present we package the data in the format that will be useful. Prometheus um, uh, is the current uh, what we support. Potentially, that can also work with uh, dynamics, open dynamics as well. Uh, we are going to investigate that later. Um, so the Kepler itself is not able to figure out what the models that's going to be used for power estimates. So we're using a thing called a model server to, to uh, make these things happen. So Kepler as a process will ex, um, export all these uh, Prometheus, all, all these um, metrics uh, as the, the, power, uh, the power stats, the rapport data, the uh, performance counters, the C-groups, file system stats, information like that through Prometheus. On the other side of the uh, Prometheus is the model server. It's about taking these stats, uh, running this uh, continuous online learning, and then build up the model. Once the model, model is um, satisfied to our you know, consumption, the capital will just download this uh, model through the Flask endpoints and uh, using that model for, uh, for part level uh, power consumption estimates. And that estimates will be uh, eventually exported through Prometheus again. So you see there's a two, uh, two export points. One is through the, um, for, the notice, uh, for the model server, the other one is for the uh, reporting purpose at the part level of the energy consumption. And then with that, I will just hand over to Chen for the demo of the running capital and uh, running the dashboard. So um, thanks, thanks for coming. So um, basically today we will show a very, very simple demo uh, running a Kepler exporter in Microchip cluster uh, installed on a biometric machine uh, where we have the NVIDIA GPU card. Um, so and, uh, the necessary prerequisites for this is uh, you need to install NVIDIA GPU operator, of course, and then uh, we install Kepler and Cube Prometheus to visualize the Prometheus data and to load our Grafana dashboard. So um, let's start with a brand new um, microshift cluster on that bell metal. And sorry, I, I pre recorded, and uh, because uh, we need to wait a certain time for the workload um, uh, to show the energy data. So now uh, we are in a brand new uh, microshift cluster. Uh, the first thing we are going to do is to deploy Kepler exporter. And uh, so in the, in the, we just go to the GitHub repo, clone the Kepler um, uh, uh, repo, and then um, there would be a deployment YAML file under Kubernetes deployment. What it has is a bunch of like um, RBAC rules, service account configurations, and also the deployment uh, YAML, the daemon site YAML for the exporter. And uh, here in argument, we enable GPU as true. So we will later show uh, not only the energy consumed by CPU, but also the energy consumed by GPU. So then we go ahead, um, find the, the uh, Kubernetes um, deployment YAML under manifest, and then all the cluster, uh, cluster or service account will be create, created. So then we see the Kepler exporter part is running under monitor namespace. And we can first check the available metrics from the log messages. And here we can see like for different pod names, we got those performance counters like 
CPU time, uh, instructions, uh, disk write and read, etc. So based on those hardware counters, uh, Kepler has a model to estimate uh, how much uh, energy uh, one part is consumed per component, such as CPU, GPU, uh, DRAM. So another way to check the availability of the Kepler matrix is through its endpoint, which is on um, 9102 part. And here uh, we can export all the CPU scaling frequencies, part CPU energy current, uh, meaning this is the energy consumed per three seconds for this part. And then it is also, uh, we are showing the DRAM, uh, CPU and GPU energies in different uh, components. Of course, we are showing the uh, total energy consumed per part. So, and uh, of course, we need then to install the uh, Cube Prometheus project. We already cloned that. Uh, project here, so we just get into the folder, and if you get uh, to the Cube Prometheus GitHub repo, uh, there is like three lines of installation command uh, you can use, and then you just copy them, and then it will set up all the necessary Prometheus stack. So we, we do the same here, and then but we need to get into the uh, Prometheus, uh, Cube Prometheus folder. It takes about two seconds to install everything. Now the Prometheus is um, also installing our cluster. What we are going to do is to go back to our Kepler project and then configure the service monitor customer resources to actually configure the scraping interval uh, of the Kepler daemon site to Prometheus. So it's a simple um, CR and it allows you to uh, choose the application selector labels and then it allows you to choose the intervals for scraping. We go ahead and create, create this CR in the cluster because the Prometheus are, is already installed, so um, it's a Prometheus operator and it automatically recognizes this uh, service monitor CR. So we double verify if service monitor is already available on the monitoring namespace. Then we want to validate well uh, the Prometheus UI. Uh, what we can do is we can do a, a simple SSH tunneling to the bare metal machine and then also do port forward to um, forward the uh, Prometheus endpoint to our local host directly. So this SSH tunnel uh, tunnels the uh, remote 399 to our local 99. And then we have another port forward command to uh, for port forward the Prometheus endpoint to um, 399 on the remote host. So then let's go to check the Prometheus UI. Here um, we have all the energy uh, consumption metrics available. This part energy stacked. Uh, we especially make it an object, so it includes all the necessary um, performance counters and also the energy con uh, consumption metrics for uh, different components for a particular part. So uh, they, in this way, you will get all the data in one query, and then it can be later used by uh, all types of uh, resource management optimizers like auto scaling and scaling. Also, uh, also, if you have some particular controllers, those data is uh, also available. So let's take another uh, example. Here is the uh, 
current energy per part. And if we choose a particular part here, which is uh, the alert manager under monitor namespace, part of the monitor stack. So we can see uh, some data because the uh, Kepler is just running, so it only has around <laughs> like less than one minute data. What we are going to do next is uh, we, uh, in Kepler project, we also have several dashboards you can try out. And then uh, we will, um, similarly, we will do SSH tunneling to the remote host and port forward the Grafana dashboard to our local host. And then we will show an example how to import uh, our Kepler uh, dashboard to Prometheus, uh, to, to, to Grafana, to the default Grafana. So now we already um, tunneling through the remote 3000 port. And then we can check the default Grafana dashboard first. Default uh, password is admin, so we, uh, we need to change it when we first log in. And then um, here is some default Grafana dashboard available in Cube Prometheus to show the resource utilization of your cluster. And then next, we are going to import um, our Kepler dashboard, one of our Kepler dashboard. So um, the, I already cloned the repo in my local laptop, so I just choose it from the, my uh, local laptop. And then what you need to configure is only the Prometheus data source and that it works. So uh, this is a simple dashboard to visualize the uh, Kepler metrics. And uh, on the top, we kind of convert the energy consumption to the equivalent pounds of coal, coals, petroleum, and natural gas we will burn uh, for a particular application. And you can choose uh, the application well, the namespace. Uh, so next, what we are going to do is we are going to, to deploy two types of workload. One is um, a CPU intensive workload, which is basically uh, generating some random numbers. It's a simple command line cat dev random. And then um, we will deploy two replicas. And then uh, the image is just uh, uh, Ubuntu image. So similarly, uh, we will test another GPU intensive workload, which is the vector addition uh, uh, workload we got from NVIDIA um, repo. It will only use one GPU. So now all the pods are running. Um, we should get back to the Grafana dashboard. Uh, first, let's change to the smaller window and then this is still uh, the monitor app and then um, here I kind of like like <laughs> cut like one minute video so uh, to wait for the workload to to run and then the default pods are on and we see there's still just a, a small amount of data similarly for the GPU but you can already see um, See like less than uh, one minute data. And here we can see um, for the GPU workload and then uh, the, the major energy cons consumption is from GPU. And if we switch to the CPU intensive workload, apparently the, the GPU DRAM usage is zero and CPU is 100% of the total.
So that's the uh, just a simple demo to show how uh, Kepler is visualizing the, um, diff uh, the the energy consumption per application for different components. And uh, the the below two charts it, it is showing like in this namespace what is the uh, peak usage application, and then the 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 uh, Bottom right one is showing over time how the energy consumption is building up for different namespace. And what's important is we also use the default Grafana dashboard to show the resource usage of Kepler daemon psi. And then you can see the, um, the received packets and the uh, transmitted packets is only like uh, 70, uh, it's only 70 to 100 packets per second, and CPU usage is only like um, uh, 0 0.02 cores, and memory is about, uh, let's go back to the memory a little bit, the memory is about like 150 megabytes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, here it's always below 150 megabytes. Okay, <laughs> that's all of the uh, that's all of the demo, um, and let's go back to the presentation. Uh, so, in summary, uh, the uh, data we are able to export it while Kepler right now include all those CPU statistics, uh, including energy consumptions. Uh, the uh, CPU timeshare, the frequency of the CPU, and all related hardware performance counters like the uh, number of instructions per container and uh, like the, um, the, the, the CPU share. And for memory, it's the same. It shows the cache misses per pod and the resident memory size per pod as well. Uh, G in GPU, we can show the energy cons consumption and resident memory size and also as well as the I.O. Uh, stats. And then in the future, uh, we want to integrate this energy consumption with the uh, carbon intensity uh, APIs. So we not only show the energy consumption per part, but also show the uh, carbon footprint per application. And then um, to further take advantage of this, um, Kepler, we also have some ideas like using those data to directly do the sustainable resource management, uh, including auto scaling and the scheduling to further optimize the uh, cluster management, resource management. So we welcome everyone to join us uh, in this sustainable computing uh, community. And we welcome all the comments, uh, issues, and PRs uh, in both the report and on the Slack channel. And then we want to send specific uh, thanks to uh, Intel and WeWorks for their good uh, comments and suggestions and ideas. Um, that's all of, the, all of the talk. Thank you. Oh yeah, that's think that is a very good point. Uh, so when we uh, build the core, could you could you repeat the question? Oh yeah. Yeah. So for the question is that um, do we, when we have the, some of the labeled counters, uh, some of the uh, correlations between the counters have a certain level of uh, correlations. Well, so so in in some of the counters, I was seeing averages. Uh, let's go back to the screen drawing. Oh no no no. For oh, the there. screenshot. Uh, I think it was in the demo actually. Okay. Um, it, uh, I think some of the labels were, were averages, if I, if I was reading it correctly. Uh -huh. uh, back when you were showing the Prometheus block. OK. Yeah. Here? Yeah, so the energy total, I think it was, pot energy total or something, I think the importance. Uh, CPU energy total, yeah. Uh, this one. OK. Average CPU total. Oh, sorry. 
almost there. Yeah, so this one. This that? Yeah. Okay. Average CPU frequency. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't the data cardinality on that be very high because you're committing the average as a label? So basically, anytime it doesn't match, you emit a new metric, essentially. Is the question there. So for the new metrics. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we take this as an average over the, the sampling period. Uh, so we actually have, because um, the, agri, uh, the average is about, um, uh, there was seven core, eight cores, so average is about the eight cores that are over the time average. So if you are looking at the, the scale, I think uh, the scale itself looks a little bit, uh, um, probably the absolute number is uh, uh, not something that you are interested in, about the, the range. So each of the CPUs has its own range. As long as uh, it's within certain range, I think that's the, the energy is about the same. So it's not the, uh, the absolute number is not about the absolute number. We are talking about the, the, CPU, uh, the frequency range. Okay. Uh, I, my understanding is that uh, when you tune x86, you have like certain scales, like 10 or 20 scales you can tune. As, as long as you are fitting into some of the scales, uh, it's going to be the similar um, frequencies. Because these frequencies, the absolute numbers will be something very hard to get. You have so many cores and so much period. It's probably can have a lot of variations. Okay, so based on the scale, then you kind of, you want that part now. You want those to be split out so that you can kind of group here. Okay. Yeah, but it's, uh, still, the, the next question is, uh, do you want to have per core levels uh, granularity or just like a, you know, average core level granularity? That's going to be a, um, going to be a scientific research items follow up. <laughs> Yes, um, sorry, this gentleman first, would you do not mind? Yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering about the, the linear model. Uh -huh. If you can explain more on that. I mean, how did you validate it? I mean, what did you test it against? Yeah, so the question is about uh, the valid, uh, whether the linear models are valid or how we're going to test this. The answer is uh, we learn this from the scientific research papers. The, uh, the research I just mentioned from the University of Texas, uh, the way they do is that they attach the parameters to each of the um, components, CPU, memory, and the disk, and they use linear models to, actu uh, to estimate the, uh, the power consumption and compare with the, the parameter readings, and they come up with the accuracy. Um, in real, in the ideal world, we do the measurements, we should be doing the same thing, because we do not have this expertise in lab. So we just assume that the readings we have come up from the, uh, the REPL counter is good enough, and that will be our ground truth when we come up with the estimates. All right. So I, I think I saw that your, the Kepler process needs information from the model server to know what values to emit. Uh -huh. But the model server needs input from the, from the process in order to know what to base that on, and I'm curious what the bootstrapping process is. Yeah. Yeah, so that is um, uh, very, uh, so the question was how the model server and the capital uh, will work together, what's the proper booting, uh, bootstrapping process. Uh, so that is a very good point. The ideal way, uh, the way we are still, is still under construction in the first place, uh, the ideal way, in my opinion, is that um, we, asked, we export all the node level stats first, and that is picked up by the model server. So model server will come up with the regression model, and then we'll tell the, uh, the, the capital will just uh, go and check the endpoints of the model server, and download the model server, and guess the coefficients, and uh, estimate the power consumption. So that is a bootstrapping process. But si once that bootstrapping process, uh, bootstrapping process is finished, we have a model in place. That model, can hopefully be port, uh, you know, can be ported to other environments as well. So when other capital process starts, they already have the basic model to use start with, and then during the learning process, they still emitting the um, the node level stats, and the model server will continue to improve on this initial model and come up with the better model. So I understand this is going to be a lot of learning and training and validating process. So that's going to be uh, uh, many of the uh, machine learning expertise built into the, the way. It's still, uh, we are still developing this process. 
And if there's a community has bad ideas, bad high expertise can help us, that is very appreciated. Mm -hmm. The metrics reducing because the underlying power consumption. Uh, so regarding to the question of uh, the model change and uh, the what is the other change? Like the, the process started using less power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm confused on how that gets, how, how you can tell the difference, I guess. How the difference between the, so I still got your question first. Uh, if you don't mind just repeating it. Uh, Uh -huh. Actually, what we thought was seven instructions equals ten watts is actually seven watts. Mm -hmm. Versus the process actually just uses three less watts than it did previously. Oh yeah. So for that part, uh, so for the question of uh, how we're going to estimate, uh, you know, for if, you know, if I just rephrase the question, for uh, the question of uh, how we're going to tell the difference between the process of uh, you know using less watts under different conditions, I my gut feeling is that um, based on these papers again. Based on this research again, if the counters and the linear regression models are sufficiently accurate, they should be um, resilient to the conditions of whether the power is off, you know, certain conditions is, um, you know, fluctuates over time. But I do uh, have your point that uh, certain things are not being built into the regression model yet, even in these um, scientific research papers. So that is going to be investigations we have to carry on in the next phase. So there are uncertainties. I uh, trust your intuition. And I do believe um, there's a certain knowledge you can still leverage, but whether that will bring us to the end game is uh, to be known and to be investigated. And there hopefully going to be uh, some resolutions or methodologies we can establish in the future. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, is there a way to distinguish between uh, decrease in power because it's actually the the model um, was reflecting the wrong data before? I see. Versus an actual power. I see. Decrease? Yeah. So regarding the model accuracy versus the ground truth, right. uh, so that kind of thing. So I think that the, the, this will come to the validation part. So when we train the model, we also validate, right? So we get we do not let's say set uh, one hundred samples to for training. Some of them will be for the validation. So if the validation does not work, then we are not using this model at all. We only use the model once the validation uh, phase will pass, like say 95% accuracy for validation, then we're using this model. If that model is broken, only gives like 80% accuracy, then we are not even trust the, um, the end results, uh, the predictions. Um, yeah, I can add something here. So uh, in the online training, right, uh, so what uh, additional uh, ground truth data you can get, right? Uh, so uh, if you already have a very accurate baseline model, and then you already know like what the, um, the core um, containers are consuming, like the core containers used by Kubernetes, right, the default containers in Kubernetes, and then any additional new applications you add to that, gives you new data. And that data serves as the additional data you can improve your model. Does that uh, answer your question? Uh, we still have half an hour to dinner, so feel free. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question from the virtual? All right. So we solved the sustainability issue for the world. We're good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.